Okay, so we have glucose, and now we need to break it down. And the question is, how do we break it down? Well, we have two stages. Uh, we have glycolysis, stage one, where we're going to break down this glucose, and we're going to smash it into two molecules of pyruvate. And we don't need any oxygen for this, and we're going to generate a little bit of ATP in the process as well. So this is anaerobic uh, uh, glycolysis. And once we add the pyruvate, we're going to break down this pyruvate even further into carbon dioxide and water. And in the process, we're going to harvest all sorts of electrons and hydrogens. Um, and if we're harvesting electrons and hydrogens, we're going to need oxygen eventually to store all those electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. So this is an aerobic process. OK, so let's talk, uh, talk about uh, glycolysis. Okay, glycolysis is, a, is an anaerobic process whereby we break down glucose uh, initially into two molecules of pyruvate, and this occurs within our cells, but outside of the mitochondria. This is not a mitochondrial process at all, and uh, the pathway is more developed in uh, sort of the more ancient branches of the revolutionary tree. Uh, further back you go, uh, the more likely that the animal, the more ancient it is, the more likely it relies on glycolysis. Its respiration. So fish, reptiles, and amphibians, especially, um, are quite reliant on glycolysis. Humans also rely on glycolysis, but it only provides energy for about the first 90 seconds of maximum exertion. So we had the phosphocreatine um, pathway, which provides us energy for about five to eight seconds of maximum exertion. Then we're going to switch over to glycolysis, which provides us uh, enough energy for about 90 seconds of maximum exertion, perhaps a bit more if you're a trained athlete. And this pathway is also called the ember meyerhoff pathway, after the people that discovered it. Um, and of note is that this pathway is very similar, or it's pretty much the same as that pathway uh, involving breakdown of glycogen. If we start with glycogen, break glycogen to glucose, and then glucose goes through glycolysis. This is referred to as glycogenolysis, and we will touch on that uh, on a slide later in this presentation. Okay, so we're going to now discuss each step of the glyco uh, glycolysis pathway. We're going to discuss each step in quite a lot of detail. We're going to discuss it as if it were a recipe, and we're mixing together um, ingredients in order to convert our glucose into pyruvate. So I'm going to start with a molecule of glucose, and we're going to add an enzyme hexokinase. And order to power the enzymatic reaction between glucose and hexokinase, we're going to need ATP. Um, and not only that, but we're actually harvesting a phosphate group from the ATP. So we're going to throw in glucose, ATP, and hexokinase together, and we're going to end up with glucose 6-phosphate. The so we basically added the phosphate group from the ATP onto the glucose, and on the sixth carbon of the chain or uh, or the string uh, in the uh, glucose carbon uh, structure, on the sixth one we've added the phosphate, and we end up with ADP. And this is a irreversible reaction. If you want to make glucose, and as if you want to make gluconeogenesis, uh, we need to use a separate enzyme called glucose six phosphatase, and glucose six phosphatase will break off the phosphate group from the glucose 6-phosphate and then we're going to just have pure glucose. So that's important to keep in mind for gluconeogenesis, which for the most part is just the reverse of glycolysis. Most of the glycolysis reactions are reversible, so just uh, as you can easily break glucose into uh, through various steps into pyruvate, in the same way you can take pyruvate and make it into glucose. There are two steps though in uh, glycolysis that are not reversible. Uh, I'm going to mention uh, this is the first one, hexakinase, but otherwise all the other steps are reversible. So you can easily make glucose using most of the steps of the glycolytic pathway. Okay, now with glucose 6-phosphate, you can make glycogen. Um, but in order to make glycogen, you're going to need to add glycogen synthetase. And glycogen synthetase takes glucose 6-phosphate and binds them together with glycogen to make glycogen strands in the muscle. So uh, although it's not part of the glycolytic pathway, I thought I'd just mentioned that at this point. So it's easy to understand where glycogen comes 
uh, into uh, the system. You, in order to make glycogen, you need to convert glucose into glucose 6-phosphate, and glucose 6-phosphate can then be polymerized into gly glycogen. But otherwise, if you want to carry on the glycolytic pathway, we're going to add another enzyme, phosphoglucose isomerase. And what that means is that uh, the isomerase basically means we're going to convert glucose into one of its isomers. Both glucose and fructose are six carbon uh, long structures and we're going to take glucose 6-phosphate and we're going to fiddle with the glucose part to make it into fructose, fructose 6-phosphate. So we've taken glucose uh, with the hexakinase, we made glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate is now going to be made into fructose 6-phosphate. Okay, so we have fructose 1-phosphate, and we're going to add another phosphate group to it. So we're going to take some more ATP, uh, both because we need the energy from the reaction and we need that phosphate. And we're going to take an enzyme called phosphofructokinase. And uh, uh, for fructose 1, oh sorry, fructose 6-phosphate and phosphofructokinase and ATP, and we mix them together, we'll end up with ADP and fructose 1,6 diphosphate, which is also called fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, um, which is uh, another way of saying exactly the same thing, that we have a phosphate at uh, carbon 1 and a phosphate at carbon 6. Now, this is also an irreversible ira reaction, and is considered to be a rate-limiting step in glycolysis. Uh, so if you have intense exercise and you need to break down glucose as fast as possible, you will break down as much glucose as your phosphofructokinase levels in your cellular tissues will allow. Uh, you cannot break more than your phosphofructokinase activity um, uh, will allow. So it's called a rate limiting step. And as I said, uh, it's an irreversible step. If you want to get glucose again, you're going to need to get a completely different enzyme. That enzyme would be fructose uh, 1,6 diphosphatase um, to get the phosphate groups of that uh, fructose um, uh, 1,6 diphosphate molecule. But anyway, we now have this fructose 1.6 diphosphatase. Now we're going to do some fun stuff. We're going to split this fructose 1.6 diphosphate by adding aldolase. And this aldolase enzyme will split it into two molecules, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And we're going to also get glyceraldehyde free phosphate. And I want you to take note of these two molecules. Um, because um, they're going to be uh, mentioned again when we talk about ketones and uh, the breakdown, the gluconeogenesis from fatty acids um, and also gluconeogenesis uh, from glycerol. But for now, um, we've got this dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde free phosphate, and we want to get rid of the dihydroxyacetone phosphate because that is not. Uh, a useful molecule to us, so we're going to add triosephosphate, triosephosphate isomerase. Triosephosphate uh, triose isomerase is going to convert that into glyceraldehyde free phosphate. So we have two glyceraldehyde free phosphate molecules at this point. So at this point, we've had to do a couple of chemical reactions uh, for our enzymes, and we've also had to invest two ATP molecules. Um, uh, for our irreversible glycolo glycolytic steps uh, in order to get to this point. So we've invested two molecules of ATP, but now we can actually start making ATP from here on out. Okay, so we have our two glyceraldehyde-free phosphate molecules, and we're going to add glyceride-free phosphate dehydrogenase, which is as our enzyme. And as our coenzyme, we're going to have NAD+. Okay, so we have a dehydrogenase, so that means we're actually going to suck hydrogens out of our molecules. Um, so we're going to end up with uh, a molecule called 1.1,3 diphosphoglycerate, uh, which is basically this molecule with the hydrogens out, and we're going to end up with NADH plus H plus. And we know now that we can send this NADH plus H plus to the electron transport chain and make some ATP. There are, however, 
uh, some complications. Uh, remember, glycolysis happens outside of your mitochondrion, um, whereas the electron transport chain is located within the, the uh, mitochondrion. So there is going to be uh, some potential energy loss as uh, the NADH has to go through some specialized pumps to get into the mitochondrial matrix and these pumps can use up ATP in and of themselves but we'll have a look at that a little bit later. But anyway we've got this NADH and H plus and they're off to the electron transport chain but we still have this 1,3 diphosphoglycerate and we're certainly not finished with it. We're gonna then add this enzyme free phosphoglycerate kinase and we're gonna add some ADP to the mix and with the help of this enzyme we're going to end up with ATP and free phosphoglycerate. Um, so this is substrative phosphorylation. Um, using our substrate enzyme we've managed to take ADP and we've managed to add phosphate to it from our substrate. And remember we uh, had two glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecules so we are actually having two free phosphoglycerate molecules. So we actually did this uh, reaction twice, and we actually had two ATP that were formed um, from um, the glucose molecule up to this point. Uh, just thought I'd mention at this point, you'll have noticed uh, in the previous two slides, whenever we have a kinase enzyme, something or other happens with ATP. Either it's broken down or it's created. And we've got another kinase enzyme uh, over on this side, uh, or this point of the glycolytic pathway, and again you have that ATP. So whenever you see kinase, think about um, ADP or ATP and whether it's entering the uh, reaction or leaving the reaction. The same way dehydrogenase, um, you'll have hydrogen leaving a molecule. But anyway, we left uh, off the previous slide of our free phosphoglycerate, and you remember there were two of them, and we're going to add phosphoglyceromutase to change its structure to two phosphoglycerate. So we moved um, uh, certain uh, the, the, the phosphate from the th position 3, and now it's at position 2. And we're going to add an enzyme called enolase now, and we're going to end up with phosphoenolpyruvate, and water. And phosphoenopyruvate is often abbreviated to PEP in textbooks. Um, so I want you to think about phosphoenopyruvate whenever you walk past a PEP store. When you see a PEP store, you're going to think phosphoenopyruvate. And I want you to remember this molecule for another reason, in that it's quite important in the gluconeogenesis genetic pathway of uh, amino acids. So we're going to uh, have a look at this uh, molecule. Um, at some point in the future in this presentation. So remember, phosphoenolpyruvate, PEP. When you're walking into PEP to buy a shirt, think phosphoenolpyruvate. Anyway, now we're going to add pyruvate kinase. And we have kinase, we're going to need ADP or ATP. In this case, we're going to take ADP and we're going to end, end up with pyruvate and another molecule of ATP. So that phospho, that phosphate, that was there uh, was taken off the pyruvate and added to ADP to make the ATP. And uh, remember, we started off with those two molecules, so this reaction actually happens twice for every um, glucose molecule. So we end up with two pyruvates, and at this point, two ATP, and also two ATP from the previous reaction. Okay, so we end up with pyruvate. And what the heck are we going to do with this pyruvate? Well, if there's no oxygen, if we are in anaerobic conditions, our pyruvate is going to end up accepting electrons. So it's going to take away the electrons from the NADH plus H plus that we had earlier, and it's going to form lactate. And it's going to free up that coenzyme NAD um, again. Now, if oxygen is present, and the pyruvate um, is uh, taken into the mitochondrial matrix and is then used in the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, and will generate even more ATP. Um, and basically the, the take-home message is that um, if you have an athlete who's running, first there's going to be glycolysis, 
uh, the pyruvate will be broken down in the presence of oxygen, hopefully your athlete is breathing, that pyruvate is going to be taken into the matrix. Um, however, if glycolysis, uh, the glycolytic pathway um, is so strained and is working at such a pace that it actually overwhelms the Krebs cycle um, in the mitochondrial matrix and the Krebs cycle cannot take the pyruvate fast enough, then uh, that excess pyruvate is going to end up being turned into lactate. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the NADH plus H plus that we make from glycolysis, um, when we have this molecule, it's stranded in the cytoplasm, and we needed to get it into the mitochondrial matrix um, in order to um, do its magic at the electron transport chain. So unfortunately, the outer membrane of the mitochondrion is impermeable uh, to NADH plus H plus, and we're going to need to figure out a way to carry, uh, to move those electrons uh, into the mitochondrial matrix. So there are shuttles that exist uh, in the mitochondrial membrane to get the electrons into the matrix. Remember, we're not really, we don't really care too much about the hydrogens. Uh, hydrogens are excessively present uh, all throughout the body. Uh, we have plenty of that. Um, these protons, what we need are those electrons. And depending on the muscle tissue, or depending on the uh, which, uh, which body tissue you're looking at, uh, different shuttles exist um, s that are specialized to specific needs of that tissue. In your heart, you have the malate aspartate shuttle. So these proteins take the electrons from NADH plus H plus, from the cytoplasmic NADH H plus. So cytoplasmic NADH plus H plus goes to the malate aspartate shuttle hands over its electrons, becomes NAD again, and then the malate aspartate shuttle shuttles electrons into the mitochondrion, and then mitochondrial NAD um, plus takes up those um, electrons to form NADH plus H plus. So um, these are two separate NAD um, molecules, cytoplasmic and mitochondrial NAD. In skelet skeletal muscle, we have a glycerol phosphate shuttle, which shuttles the electrons in, and it takes electrons from NADH plus H plus, but it gives it to FAD to form FADH2. And remember, um, NADH plus H plus can um, make uh, 3 ATP per molecule, uh, but FADH2 can only make 2 ATP per molecule. So whereas in the heart it's quite efficient, and we still have 3 ATP more or less, um, because we still have NADH plus H plus, uh, in our skeletal muscle, Actually, it's not as efficient. We're only going to get 2 ATP, whereas potentially we could have made 3 ATP from our uh, originator molecule. And then when we have too much pyruvate, that pyruvate is going to be converted into lactate through the, uh, through the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. And what happens is that we have our NADH plus H plus uh, and pyruvate, and in the presence of lactate dehydrogenase, NAD uh, H plus H plus gives us electrons to the pyruvate and we get lactate. And of course the NAD coenzyme. Uh, this lactate can then be transported into the mitochondrion for the lac uh, lactate shuttle and in within the mitochondrion can then be broken up again by lactate dehydrogenase into pyruvate and NADH plus H plus. So this is a slightly more um, efficient mechanism. Um, now of note is that if you if your mitochondrial matrix um, processes are overwhelmed and there's simply no space for the lactate to come in and make pyruvate and NADH plus H plus because the Krebs cycle is just too overwhelmed with what pyruvate already has, then that lactate is going to leave uh, rather than going into the mitochondrial mitochondrion is actually going to leave the cell and then you're going to have an increase in your serum lactate and then that lactate will then be uh, will eventually diffuse into some other tissue and it will be used up in that tissue uh, tissues mitochondrion so um, uh, one cell's glycolytic pathway can make lactate which is then used up in another cell's mitochondrial pathway um, also want you to note that lactate can easily take up another additional uh, proton to become ionized into lactic acid and pretty much almost any molecule that ends with an 8 uh, is a kind of molecule that can easily take an additional proton just like here, over here can take an additional proton to become an acid version of itself so lactate very easily 
grabs the hydrogen and forms lactic acid, which is thought to be uh, uh, one of the, the causes of uh, uh, exercise pains. But we'll go into that, to that in a little bit more detail in a later slide. Okay, so let's talk about how much ATP is made from glycolysis. We started off with one glucose molecule, and said under optimum efficiency, under optimum conditions, everything goes according to plan. We're going to end up with four ATP from substrate phosphorylation. Now, I'm sure that uh, most of us have enough life experience to know that uh, optimum efficiency and optimum conditions are relatively uncommon, but uh, for the sake of argument, we're going to assume optimal efficiency, we've got 4 ATP from substrate phosphorylation. Remember that we had two steps, two irreversible steps that required ATP, so we already used up eight, 2 ATP just to get our 4 ATP, and so we have a net gain of 2 ATP. So we had 2 ATP to jumpstart glycolysis, uh, we made 4 ATP, uh, what we are left with is a gain of 2 ATPs um, just from its uh, substrate phosphorylation pathway. But remember, we also made some NADH, and remember there are different uh, shuttles uh, available, and some shuttles uh, uh, give their electrons to um, FADH, and uh, FADH2 can make. 2 ATP per molecule, and since uh, we split the glucose into two components, each component can make an FADH2, uh, so we have two uh, FADH2s, um, each one can make 2 ATP, so we can at the very minimum make 4 ATP. However, if we have one of those efficient uh, shuttles uh, present, for example, in cardiac muscle, and our electrons are transferred from the NADH2, mitochondrial NADH, each NADH can make 3 ATP, um, we split the glucose into 2 molecules, we're going to have 2 of these NADHs, so we're going to have 6 ATP. Um, but depending on which shuttle we use, uh, we're going to have anything between 4 and 6 ATP. And we have about 30% of the energy from the glucose molecule as ATP, and r the rest is lost as heat. And uh, as you can see, glycolysis is not a uh, terribly uh, efficient way of making ATP. Um, the, the cytosol component makes only 2 ATP um, in gain, and then we have an additional 4 to 6 ATP if we're lucky enough to have our mitochondria working and our electron transport chain working uh, under optimum efficiency. Let's add these two together, and we're going to have 6 to 8 ATP uh, at best from the glycolytic pathway. And because the glycolytic pathway is not that efficient, um, the body only relies on it to generate about 5% of the total body ATP. So although uh, glycolysis is not uh, a very cost-effective way of making ATP, there are certain advantages. First of all, it's a very fast reaction, so we can make when we need ATP in a hurry, we can uh, use glycolysis, and glycolytic enzymes are quite plentiful. Um, so it's readily available in all our uh, body tissues, and any heavy muscular exertion will rely on glycolysis. An example would be swimming, gymnastics, and the last all out sprint at the end of the marathon. And um, the end product of glycolysis, the pyruvate is going to go straight into our Krebs cycle and is going to be broken down even further to make even more ATP. So we do need glycolysis to fuel the citric acid cycle, uh, which is our body's main way of generating ATP. Anyway, at this point, uh, when we have pyruvate, we've only extracted about 10% of the potential energy that we can extract from glucose. So it's a fast step, but we're going to need to maximize, we're going to need to further extract energy from the 90% that's left from our 2 pyruvate molecules, and we're going to go into the citric acid cycle. 
before we go into the Crypt cycle, or the Citric Acid cycle as it's called, um, let's review glycolysis and let's look at the glycogen and lactate in the Cori cycle. Let's start off by checking out this bird's eye view of glycolysis. Um, basically everything that we discussed um, earlier, but um, uh, in a flow diagram form. We're going to start off with gluc glucose, we're going to phosphorylate it, we're going to take a inorganic phosphate from an ATP molecule and stick it on the 6-carbon in the glucose molecule to get glucose 6-phosphate using hexokinase. It's an irreversible reaction. If we want to reverse it, we have to add glucose 6-phosphatase. And the phosphohexoisomerase, we're going to change glucose into its isomer, fructose. Basically, uh, glucose and fructose have pretty much the same chemical formula, but the elements in the, in the structures are arranged slightly differently. Um, specifically, uh, the position of oxygen is changed in glucose to make it into fructose. And then we end up with fructose 6-phosphate. Uh, then we're going to phosphorylate it yet again with this phosphorus, uh, phosphofructokinase. Uh, if you have a kinase enzyme, you are know, doing something or other with ATP, um, either extracting ATP or breaking down ATP. I'm going to have fructose 1.6 diphosphate. And there are alternative names for all the molecules in the um, glycolytic pathway, depending on which textbook uh, you read, so don't be too alarmed when you come across alternative names. But we have fructose with a uh, phosphate uh, molecule at carbon 1 and carbon 6, and we're going to break it down with aldolase to make dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde free phosphate. Glyceral glycerol can be transformed into glyceraldehyde free phosphate, we'll touch on that a bit later, and ketone bodies can be made into dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and we'll touch on that a bit later as well. Um, dihydroxyacetone phosphate is not particularly useful in and of itself, so we take an isomerase and change it into uh, its isomer of glyceraldehyde free phosphate. And bear in mind, um, we've got one glyceraldehyde free phosphate made directly from fructose 1.6 uh, diphosphate, and we've got one, another one made from dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So at this point, we actually have two molecules, which is why I've split this glycolytic pathway into two pathways, exactly the same pathway. But, go, um, but um, because we have two molecules, we have two instances of the pathway. And we're going to start harvesting hydrogen from this glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate with our dehydrogenase enzyme. And we're going to add some hydrogens to our NAD coenzyme. And we're going to have 1.3 uh, diphosphoglycerate. Um, and then from this glycerate, we're going to start harvesting uh, the phosphate ions. We're going to have phosphoglycerate kinase. And take away a phosphate to make ATP to a free phosphoglycerate. Um, we're gonna have to shift that uh, phosphate group, so we're gonna have a glycerol mutase, and it's gonna shift the phosphate group to carbon two. We're gonna throw in some enolase uh, to make phosphoenol pyruvate, and then we want to end off with pyruvate, so we need to get rid of this phos. Uh, inorganic phosphate, so we're going to have a pyruvate kinase, and uh, we're going to uh, take away this phosphate and make it ATP, and we're going to have the end product of pyruvate, and pyruvate can be transformed to lactate, lactate through lactate dehydrogenase, or it can go into uh, the mitochondrion uh, to take part in the citric acid cycle. Alright, so let's talk about lactate. Let's say you're out on a run and uh, you've attended this bioenergetics lecture so you know that as you're running your glycolytic pathway um, starts breaking down glucose to, and that we end up having pyruvate and pyruvate needs to go into the mitochondria for the Krebs cycle and we know that um, if in the mitochondria ATP is mainly generated with the electron transport chain and for that we need oxygen. Now at some point uh, if you keep pushing yourself to run faster and faster, or you run long enough, eventually the demand for energy uh, from your body is going to exceed uh, the supply of energy. Either we're going to exceed 
uh, oxygen. We need oxygen to be that final step in the electron transport chain, otherwise the entire electron transport chain just shuts down in the absence of oxygen uh, and we cannot have aerobic respiration anymore. Uh, alternatively, there's uh, a shortage of glucose or a shortage of enzyme or um, whatever can happen. Um, but let's say uh, that you're running and our mitochondrial mechanisms are overwhelmed, either there's not enough oxygen or there's just simply too much pyruvate to process. And in our cytosol, uh, we're going to have a buildup of pyruvate because there's so much pyruvate in the mitochondrial matrix, so all the shuttles are. Uh, all the transport mechanisms are clogged uh, with excess pyruvate, so we're going to have this excess pyruvate and we're going to, with that, have excess uh, NADH plus H+. Plus. Now remember that one uh, step where we break down glyceraldehyde-free phosphate in the glycolytic pathway, we use a dehydrogenase enzyme to ha uh, harvest hydrogens and add it to the NAD coenzyme to make NADH plus H+. Plus. Um, without that coenzyme, we cannot harvest hydrogens, we cannot go through that step uh, of breaking down glyceraldehyde-free phosphate and therefore we cannot make more pyruvate. So not only are we uh, do we have an excess of pyruvate, but uh, our entire glycolytic pathway is going to shut down um, because we uh, at, uh, at a critical juncture in the in the glycolytic pathway before we can even do substrate phosphorylation uh, we are also stuck because of the shortage of, um, of coenzyme NAD. So in order to make that ATP through substrate of phosphorylation in the glycolytic pathway we need to urgently get rid of these hydrogens, get rid of these protons and uh, electrons they're carrying and free up enough NAD plus <coughs> Uh, that we can harvest more hydrogens from glyceraldehyde free phosphate and make the next step of the glycolytic pathway so that we can make some at least some ATP for substrate of phosphorylation while our mitochondrial matrixes and electron transport chains are overwhelmed. And uh, what happens is that lactate dehydrogenase will take these hydrogens, these protons and the electrons, stick it onto a pyruvate molecule to make lactate. <coughs> and obviously we need to overwhelm our mitochondrial mechanisms before the body starts deciding to make lactate, so this typically happens with strenuous exercise. Now bear in mind, pretty much any molecule that ends with an 8 has a chemical structure that um, promotes combining with a proton, and when you combine, uh, when a molecule combines with a proton, it forms an acid. So lactate very easily forms lactic acid and hydrogens, I, uh, ions are very plentiful in the human body so it's extremely difficult for lactate to remain in a lactate form. Um, it very easily goes in and out of the acid form. So for all intents and purposes uh, in the human body lactate and lactic acid are so easily interchangeable that they're pretty much um, the same thing. And with this rise in lactic acid, we're going to have a rise in pH, oh sorry, a drop in pH, and our enzymes are very sensitive uh, to pH changes, uh, our enzymes work, uh, at a s are designed to work at a specific uh, level of pH, where pH is basically a measure of free hydrogens available um, in, the, in the tissue. And if you think about our dehydrogenase enzymes, they need to harvest hydrogens from molecules. Um, but if they are already in the presence of a high um, environmental uh, level of hydrogens, it might be difficult, f uh, f uh, there might uh, be competition at the receptors for the enzymes to work. And just, uh, that's just one example of a way an enzyme can be inactivated uh, by falling pH. And so with this falling pH, our enzymes are inactivated, our pathways become relatively more inefficient, uh, they find it more difficult to do their job, our enzymes uh, are not working at optimal efficiency, uh, we cannot generate as much ATP as we could when our pH was at the normal level and this possibly contributes to our feelings of fatigue that we get um, with strenuous exercise because we simply cannot replace the ATP at the same rate.
get some lactate. Uh, we'll go for the lactate shuttle uh, at the mitochondrial membrane to donate hydrogens into the mitochondrial matrix to go into the electron transport chain. Most of the lactate actually rapidly diffuses into the blood. And uh, really the main reason why we have lactate is to free up NAD. So we quickly take away those hydrogens and quickly rush off into the bloodstream. Eventually that lactate will be taken up by some peripheral uh, uh, tissues and um, hydrogens will be harvested from the lactate. So uh, that potential energy is not uh, ever totally lost. But the main reason we have the lactate mechanism is because we have this NAD now coenzyme now freed up and it can urgently return to the work of breaking down glycerol aldehyde free phosphate um, which can then allow substrate of phosphorylation in the subsequent glycolytic steps. Okay, so as mentioned, um, lactate takes hydrogen ions and with these hydrogen ions we have electrons. So, um, in essence, lactate is an emergency storage mechanism for excess electrons that are harvested from glucose. And uh, eventually even this mechanism of, of propping up glycolysis uh, can be overwhelmed and eventually there's simply too much lactate, um, too much NADH plus H plus, not enough NAD plus coenzyme um, um, and this or aldehyde free phosphate cannot be broken down and the entire glycolytic pathway jams to a halt. Uh, no more ATP is formed and you have muscle fatigue and eventually muscle failure once all available ATP is used up. So once you have been, um, had muscle failure and you've dropped your barbell or your dumbbells or you've collapsed on the side of the, of the road race, um, you rest a bit and you breathe and you restart up that oxygen supply allow the mitochondrial matrix to um, sort out um, whatever pyruvate it still can and eventually you start to recover and then this excess lactate which has been spilling into your bloodstream can either go into your mitochondrial matrix and donate its hydrogens to be used as an energy source either in its originator um, cell or whichever peripheral cell it ends up in or can be converted back into glucose and this conversion uh, from lactate to glucose is a pathway called Cori, the Cori cycle named after the people that discovered it and it's mainly present in humans in the liver and in uh, starving humans there's also some ability for the kidneys uh, to uh, generate glucose from the Cori cycle. There is also some Cori cycle capability in white muscle fiber. It's thought not to be uh, clinically significant in humans. Um, this pathway is much more developed in certain animals, so they can basically um, uh, do. Uh, they basically have a gluconeogenesis pathway in their muscle tissue, but not so in humans. So how does a Cori cycle work? Um, well, you basically just have a look at your glycolytic pathway and start at the bottom um, with lactate, with lactate dehydrogenase converting the lactate to uh, pyruvate and you start at the bottom of that flow diagram and just work your way all the way to the top. You will notice that most of those reactions are reversible. There are two uh, irreversible reactions. Uh, for the first one, just add fructose 1.6 diphosphatase to remove uh, that phosphate group and then to convert glucose 6 uh, phosphate to glucose just add glucose 6 phosphatase to remove that phosphate group and there you have a brand new spanking molecule um, of glucose. Okay so if we have uh, glycolysis we also need to have glycogenolysis glycogen is a storage form of glucose. It's the way that muscles store glucose within their tissue and it's readily available to enter metabolic pathways. And before we can break down glycogen and glycogenolysis we need to first know how is glycogen um, made. 
So to make glycogen, we're going to take that glucose 6-phosphate that we had made with our first step in the glycolytic pathway and we're going to throw in some phosphoglucomutase and we're just going to move that phosphate group from position 6 to position 1 so we're going to have glucose 1-phosphate and this is a reversible reaction then we're going to throw in some uridine triphosphate with our glucose 1-phosphate and we're going to have uridine diphosphate glucose pyrophosphatase um, as our enzyme. The pyro indicates that there's pyridoxine, one of the vitamin B vitamins in this enzyme. And we're going to end up with uridine diphosphate glucose and diphosphate. Uridine diphosphate glucose can also be made from galactose, um, which I'll briefly touch on as well. So we have this uridine diphosphate glucose, and we're going to convert that into glycogen using an enzyme called glycogen synthetase. And glycogen synthetase is then going to convert this molecule into uh, glycogen, and this glycogen is immediately going to attach itself to another glycogen and therefore um, you don't really have glycogens floating around freely in the cytosol they all chain up to make long strands of glycogen okay so that's um, glycogenesis how we get glycogen so now let's touch on glycogenolysis we want glucose again so we can add it to our glycolytic pathway we're going to have a phosphorylase enzyme which is going to break the phosphate bonds in, uh, between, our two glyc between our glycogen and the glycogen chain and it um, transforms that glycogen immediately back into glucose 1-phosphate glucose 1-phosphate is transformed by phosphoglucomutase into glucose 6-phosphate and that merrily will then go into your glycolytic pathway so as I mentioned glycogen is uh, preferentially stored in muscle it's released during intense exertion to keep the glycolytic pathway to make ATP so that you can keep going and when you're exhausted or fatigued um, it's, uh, that, that exhaustion fatigue is thought to correlate um, with glycogen store exhaustion so even though you have lactate buildup and metabolic jamming of your ATP mechanisms um, for athletes the real sort of limiting factor in their performance is when the glycogen stores are exhausted. Let's touch on uh, adrenaline and how it influences glycogen breakdown. Um, I'm sure you've heard anecdotal stories of people who were frightened or excited and got a burst of energy. Um, perhaps a story of an athlete who heard his name being uh, called from the crowd and got a sudden rush of energy um, and that's possibly due to the effect of adrenaline when you're excited you release adrenaline and adrenaline hits uh, adrenaline receptors uh, in your tissues and when these adrenaline receptors are stimulated ATP is converted to cyclic AMP um, through the action of adenylate cyclase and this cyclic AMP converts protein kinase from an inactive to an active form protein kinase almost like as the next step in a sort of chain of dominoes then activates phosphorylase kinase and phosphorylase kinase in turn activates phosphorylase um, and remember phosphorylase um, is the enzyme that breaks up um, the glycogen chain and remember we have kinase enzymes here and kinase enzymes always do something or other with ATP so you use up ATP in the sort of dom 2 ATP in this domino chain and plus that ATP to convert um, uh, convert cyclic AMP so what does this mean? Um, basically it means when you're excited, when you have adrenaline running through your veins um, you break down glycogen much more quickly you uh, have much more glucose 6-phosphate available and you have much more glucose 6-phosphate being broken down through the glycolytic pathway so you literally get a burst of energy 
due to the effects of adrenaline. Okay, so let's talk about the effects of uh, training on, uh, on what we have discussed up to this point. And what we have discussed up to this point is electron transfer, glycolysis and glycogen analysis. Now, uh, I did mention earlier, glycolysis provides energy for about 90 seconds worth of maximal exertion. And this pathway is already pretty much almost at maximum efficiency, even in untrained um, persons. And you're not going to get much of an improvement uh, through training. However, uh, some mad scientists have done studies on animals, and animal models uh, suggest a few changes. Uh, the reason why we prefer animal models is that to really study the effects of training on a muscle, we need to take muscle biopsies. Uh, muscle does not regenerate, so a muscle biopsy is pretty much a permanent um, damage that you have inflicted uh, upon a muscle. Um, it's not terribly ethical to inflict permanent damage on uh, human beings just to f uh, further the science of, uh <coughs> of sport. So we rely on animal models to give us an idea of what happens um, with the effects of physical training. And unfortunately, animal models not always translate 100% uh, into human models. Sometimes what's true for the animal is not true for the human, and also vice versa. Uh, but at least we can have a rough idea if there is some sort of change. Now, animal models suggest that with endurance training, uh, you have increases in hexokinase activity as that first enzyme of the um, glycolytic pathway converting glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. So we put a pig on a treadmill, or a dog on a treadmill, and make it uh, run a bit uh, on a regular basis. You're going to have that increased exokinase activity when you do a muscle biopsy. Not only that, but endurance training seems to increase your mitochondrial mass. So you have the same number of mitochondria, but they're thicker and heavier. Uh, not only that, but there's also increased levels of mitochondrial lactate dehydrogenase and decreased cytoplasmic lactate dehydrogenase. And the overall effect of that is that in the cytoplasm you have less lactate made. So you're going to have less lactic acid. Um, hypothetically, that should allow your glycolytic pathway to maintain optimal efficiency for longer um, because of the absence of that pH changing acid. Um, that lack, uh, what pyruvate and lactate is made, um, is more easily shunted into the mitochondrial matrix. Um, so you have more pyruvate uh, being shunted into the mitochondria and less pyruvate being lost as lactate, eventually leaving the cell. So there's greater pyruvate uh, amounts of pyruvate available for your citric acid cycle. So that's endurance training. Now, animal models for strength training or resistance training are a little bit more difficult to find. It's kind of hard to ask a pig or a dog to do some barbell squats or some dumbbell bicep curls. Um, I have not been able to find any study or textbook uh, of good quality telling me what happens to the mitochondria when you have increased muscle mass. We know that um, people with increased muscle mass have a greater metabolic rate, so they have an increased catalytic um, activity. Um, the, uh, after a strength training session, your metabolic rate goes up for about 48 hours, so something must be happening at an energy level to cause that increase in metabolic rate. But exactly how the mitochondria are affected or exactly how our metabolic processes uh, are affected um, on the cellular level, I personally have not been able to find any good data um, studying that. And as I said, it's probably due to limitations um, due, uh, due to pigs not being able to do effective barbell squats. Ideally, we'd want to go grab some bodybuilders and some strength trainers and weightlifters and um, punch them with biopsy needles and take lots of muscle uh, tissue and see what happens. I would imagine your average bodybuilder has worked quite hard to get his muscle and does not want to lose muscle to a big biopsy needle, uh, which is another limitation. So we have this increased cata catalytic activity, which is reasonably unexplained. Um, what uh, studies I have seen show that there's no increased amount of mitochondria and strangely enough there's no
there does not seem to be any increased mitochondrial mass. So while running a marathon increases your mitochondrial mass, lifting weights does not increase your mitochondrial mass. So there's still a bit of mystery as to where this increased um, metabolic rate comes from, uh, from strength training and weightlifting. Okay, so we've gone into detail how glucose is broken down. But glucose is not the only sugar we absorb in our diet. Um, other sugars we absorb for our diet are fructose, sucrose, and galactose. And I want to just touch briefly on the metabolism of these sugars and how they relate to glyco glycolysis. Start off with table sugar, sucrose. Uh, we're going to hydrolyze that with an enzyme in water. Sucrose is hydrolyzed with fructo fructose and glucose. Glucose we've already dealt with in detail. Um, so let's talk about how fructose is uh, from sucrose is metabolized and how dietary fructose is metabolized. Well, um, fructose is converted either to fructose 6-phosphate, and we've already met fructose 6-phosphate in the glycolytic pathway. So uh, that goes straight into the glycolytic pathway and that's sorted. Um, or sometimes it's converted into fructose 1-phosphate. So instead of plopping the phosphate on the 6th carbon where it's supposed to be, it's plopped on the 1st carbon. And then it becomes, um, um, then it has to undergo a process called fructolysis. So with fructolysis, we're going to take fructose 1-phosphate and split it in dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Uh, which can be converted to glyceraldehyde-free phosphate, and that can go straight into glycolytic pathway. And we also have glyceraldehyde. Glyceraldehyde needs to be convert uh, needs to have some phosphate added onto it by an enzyme to be converted into glyceraldehyde-free phosphate, and then only then can it go into the uh, glycolytic pathway. And the enzyme is present to convert fructose and to um, uh, to let fructose undergo fructolysis. These enzymes are mostly uh, present in the intestines and the liver. We then have galactose. Galactose is converted by enzymes into uridine diphosphate glucose, and we've already met uridine diphosphate glucose um, in our glycogen pathways. And now the dietary sugars, our main dietary sugars, lactose and maltose. Um, like sucrose, these are disaccharides, so lactose is broken down by lactase to glucose and galactose. Um, and then maltose can be broken down by several enzymes, maltase, sucrose, and alpha-dextrinase, uh, into its component glucose molecules.